What's up? Today I'm talking about meth culture. My name is Jackie. I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. I had a battle with drugs and alcohol for 14 years. I'm now sober seven years. Today I'm discussing meth culture. This is part two. If you haven't seen part one, I cover some of the like basics of what it was like living inside a world dominated by the drug methamphetamine and how that drug culture is drastically different than any other drug culture I've experienced, including the culture of cocaine, ecstasy, mushrooms, marijuana, among many other drugs. Meth stood out to me as by far being the most extreme, the most dangerous, the most fatal and not because of overdosing on the drug, but because of the lifestyle that accompanied this specific drug. So I'm covering today the trips, the crash, the secrecy, and the codes. If that sounds like something that you want to learn more about, let's go. First things first, trigger warning. I don't think it'll trigger many people because I'm sharing like the bad sides of that drug, not so much the good side. Um, with any drug, you take it for a reason. It does deliver you something that you're craving. And for me, that was that upper. I wanted that upper energy because as somebody that's, that deals with chronic depression, that's what I was looking to like readjust within my brain. What I didn't realize was all the um, detrimental effects it would have over long-term use to my brain but I want to be very clear, the intentions of this video is not that I'm glorifying, glamorizing, or even vilifying meth users and drug use in general. It's to bring attention to if you have a loved one or you're uh, yourself experimenting with a lot of different drugs, it's almost like a warning sign of like, these are the hazards that come with heavy meth use heavy drug use. Okay, so let's just start. The trips. What I mean by the trips, if you've never used meth, the trips basically means um, when you take this substance, it causes you to kind of like trip out in your mind and not like, a well, in a way a hallucinogenic, but the hallucinating only comes from a drastic sleep deprivation. So when you use methamphetamine, and I'm only speaking from my own personal experience, I didn't sleep for up to two weeks at a time. I just used, 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 used. And so it causes you to be wide awake, fully alert, but not necessarily um, alert in a productive way. So this is where the trips come in. The trips is basically like you start to obsess over a singular urge, a singular activity, a singular thing you heard. Maybe it's auditory, maybe it's visual, maybe it's even something that you hallucinated, but you believe to be real. This is sort of how I would describe a trip. You go on it, you go on this trip, and you trip for like hours on end. I want to say some of my trips lasted up to six hours, possibly nine. And from an outsider looking in, what you might see is this person is like, for instance, you go inside their house and they've just got bits and bits and bits of tiny little particles of electronics because they've just like dismantled their whole entertainment system piece by piece. They're picking it apart. And what they're looking for, you maybe have no idea. Maybe they don't even have any idea what they're looking for. But that's like the trip they've gone on is like, I'm going to take this apart. I'm going to see what's inside it. And then maybe even I'm going to put it back together. This is called disassembling electronics. That falls into that category. Like for me specifically, I had this friend that she loved to sing and she had a family member. And whenever I say family member, I'm always referring to like my friend's family or families that I dealt with in my active addiction. I'm not referring to my own family. But there was a family member's house out in the middle of the desert and she liked to go out there and just like basically sing, put on karaoke, and I would just sit and like draw for hours on end. But there was also a huge array of things to do in the, the yard, which out there, the yard was basically just dirt. Yeah, just basically dirt, just 
acres and acres of dirt and there would be like weapons poking out um there would be like knives um those circular saw blades um lots of little shed type houses uh just abandoned cars so loads of car parts what else just random stuff like that you could just make something with trips don't have to be um dangerous they can be and an example of a dangerous one would be like when I was out in her yard out in the middle of the desert I got on this trip where I was like in my mind I was like going into training like I'm going into training and I'm training to kill somebody because I know sooner or later somebody's coming after me and I'm gonna have to be in like the absolute best shape of my life so that I survive and this was like the trip that I was going on in my head was like all right day one training I was taking these circular saw blades and I was just throwing them like as hard as I could at the tree and on this particular thing I was just focused on like building up my strength like let's see how far I can throw it let's see how um let's let's also do like some target practice let's shoot for a specific spot on that tree let's pretend it's a person and then just keep on and I did that for a while and then after that I moved on to something else and so these trips can kind of take like a twisted turn Meth makes people pissed off violent. It makes them irritable because like you're, you're not sleeping for up to weeks on end. For me, I think I went almost two weeks at a certain point. I couldn't keep track of the time, but all I knew was I didn't run out of the drug. So I just kept taking it. And when I ran out of it, I would crash. Um, and then I would start all over again. So a crash to me it basically looked like my body collapsing because I couldn't get any more of this drug in this moment. And my body was like so tired from going, 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 going for two weeks with almost zero food. Just these Ensure shakes that I was forced to drink um, from my dealer because if I didn't drink those, I wasn't eating. So that was how he kind of sustained me. Um... And I was drinking most all alcohol, very little water. So when I stopped taking the drug, my body basically was like right into sleep mode. I would sleep for up to 20 to 24 hours. I remember I would wake up and it would, it would be like the next day and I would just say, how long have I been sleeping? And they'd always say around 20, 24 hours, which is like crazy. I don't even know if I got up to go to the bathroom. That's the crash. And the crash is like all mental too because there might be some physical involved. But for me, it was mostly mental, which was all happening within your brain. So when you're taking so many stimulants, your um, dopamine receptors, oh God, I hope I don't butcher this stuff. Obviously, like I don't, I don't speak science, but you're basically telling your brain, like flooding it with dopamine with the drug. And so your uh, brain naturally usually produces dopamine on its own, but because you're flooding it with so much excess dopamine, those receptors that let out dopamine within your brain, they stop because they're like, whoa, we have more than enough here. But then when you stop taking the drug, you crash, you crash double because now your brain is like not producing that naturally. And if you're not taking the drug, you're just like really low. And so I think that's what causes most people to pick it back up because that drug, you know, it's instant. You're going to flood your system with more dopamine, a whole hell of a lot of dopamine, and your brain isn't even producing it anymore naturally. So when you go to treatment, like for me anyway, they force you to do things or they did me that naturally produce dopamine so that my brain can start producing that again, like working out, exercise, um, these sort of things to help start of re, <laughs> re, um, to help with the recovery. So that's basically the crash. And then moving on to the secrecy, this is harder for me to talk about because I'm almost like ashamed 
still that I did a lot of this stuff or that these were the type of people that I was running with and I thought like this was a cool thing this was like my thing for a long time and it's sad to think back on it and it's very scary as well because the lifestyle is what will get you with meth it's very violent it's very shady it's very secretive the secrecy it's hard to describe it's basically like you can go in a house and everything looks normal but if you're like in with that family then you know there's stash spots, there's places inside that house to hide bodies, dead or alive, to hide guns, to hide drugs, to hide cash. Um, there's sheds, there's back doors that nobody knows about. There's all sorts of things like in the basement. Um, it's just almost like, say you go into a house and you're not like in with that family. So you just sit in the living room, you go to the restroom, maybe you go in one of the bedrooms. But if you're like in with that family, oh, you know, you're going downstairs, you're going out in the backyard, you're going in the garage, you know all the other areas where like the actual shit is happening. And that's the best way I can describe it is like, it's, it's like, there's so many houses across the United States that I've experienced anyway where that's where the action happens. It's in the garage, it's in the basement, it's in the backyard, it's at a guest house 10 feet down the thing. It's like all these different hidden spots that are on the residence but you wouldn't pay attention to like if you didn't know that if it's hard to describe, right? So it's also a lot of families have a meth user living at their house. It's usually a family member and they don't want to put them out. So they just say like, well, you guys go out back and yeah, you can do that. Like they know you're doing it, but you can't do it in the main house. You need to do it in the guest house or you need to do that in the basement or you need to do that in the back shed. And so there's a lot of secrecy of like, it's going on in that house. It's just everybody is hiding it because they don't want to see it. They don't want to acknowledge it. They don't want to deal with it. And then there's the houses that are just completely overrun by it. And that's their whole thing is like the whole family does it. It's complete dysfunction. They're all criminals. That's more of an extreme example. But yeah, that's probably more common than you may think as well. A good example of the secrecy is like me specifically, like this one house that I started going to. Well, I was an out of towner in a state that knew no one, but my dude was locked up and my dude, that was like his hometown. And so what would happen is I would sort of use his name as like credit. And so I would say like, oh, well, I'm with Brody example. Like, obviously that's not his name. I'm with Brody. He's locked up right now. Um, do you know so-and-so? And I would start to sort of network within like the type of people that he ran with. And then sooner or later, I would click with someone. And in this case, it was like the family friend. And then he would kind of vouch for me and say like, oh, that's Jackie. She's Brody's girl. He's locked up. So I'm looking after her. And so I would sort of become in with a lot of different people within the drug community in that specific city just because somebody was vouching for me basically it's very secretive like it's like for instance if you go up to somebody that you don't know and are like hey do you know where to get any help like most people are gonna be like fuck no like who who are you who do you think i am like that's really suspicious you have to like work your way in. You have to build a network. You have to sort of collaborate with other people so that you have access to drugs, a constant source. You might be selling them. Like in my case, I wasn't just in with that family friend for free. Like I had to pull my own weight. I wasn't fucking the dude. So that means I needed to sell a lot of shit every day. Um, that was my example. But I hope that kind of illustrates the secrecy of it. It's like a very taboo drug compared to like 
other drugs like smoking weed you can go in so many houses and the parents are just like hey what's up um can you grab me an ounce or can you go down to so-and-so's and pick me up a pound like it's nothing like smoking weed is nothing and this is before it was legal it's like that's fine that's just like like smoking cigarettes basically nobody trips out about it you can go in plenty of houses the parents are smoking you're smoking with the parents or you're in the other room smoking but they know there's no secrets behind it it meth was always more of a like taboo like especially if you were shooting the shit which that might be comparable to heroin culture but I know very little about heroin culture because that was not my thing but yeah meth was like if you shoot meth you definitely can't do that out in public inside somebody's house. It has to be what they call a slam pad, which is like a dope house or a house that's like everybody is doing that inside the house. Um, so I hope that like touches a bit on the secrecy. And so let's go into the last point, which is the codes. The codes kind of tie in with the secrecy really like, for instance, when my dude was locked up, I wanted to write him letters, but I had to speak in code because otherwise that would be incriminating myself, getting him wrapped up in a whole nother thing when he's already in there doing time. So you have to speak in codes. And what I mean by codes is let's use the example of an extracurricular activity. So you pick words and those words represent different things so they carry a double meaning so like for example um let's use cooking as an example because i know there's kind of like a fine line between speaking about this and not wanting to like teach anybody to do this it's more about speaking of it as an example of basically really what not to do. So um, so cooking is synonymous with manufacturing meth. So we're gonna use that an example because it's a shit example. If you call somebody on the phone and are like wanting to meet up, you can't exactly say like what you're doing. So that's where the codes come in. So, hey, do you wanna come over? I'm getting ready to cook some, I'm getting ready to bake up a bunch of stuff for this bake sale for so-and-so's school. Do you want to help? I've already got the flour, I've got the spatula, I've got the mixer. The only thing I really need is a set of bowls. So there you go. A simple sentence about cooking, but it actually carries the double meaning. What I'm saying in this example is the flour is the shit. Um, so I have shit. Do you want to come help me bag this shit up so we can send it off is basically what the message is. And you're also going to get fucked up if you come over here. So I am saying I have everything, but the only one thing I don't have is a set of bowls. So whatever bowls represents in that example, for me, it would probably be, I need fresh needles. So if you want to bring the bowls, the bowls are the needles. Um, I've got the mixer. The mixer is the pipe. You see where I'm going with this? So if I ever wanted to call somebody else, we have a code, we have an understanding, and then you use this code within your circle to say what you're trying to say without really saying anything. That's the codes. The codes are also um, very strategic when you think back on it. And my mom used to say something to me when I was still on drugs, which was, if you could only channel all that energy you put into bad and you could channel it into good, you could do so much. And I 1000% agree with that statement because when I think back on the meticulous detail and planning that we did for some of this stupidest shit, it's like, to me, it's like, <clears throat> what a colossal waste of time. How much time did I waste doing this stuff when I could have been doing something better? So I hope you can take some of these examples and maybe learn from it like if you have a child that doesn't seem to be you know into anything yet they're constantly talking to their friends about this hobby but you don't actually ever see them doing this hobby that could be a red flag so people that use drugs they can often be misclassified as people that don't care people that are lazy people that are not intelligent but 
my experience was all kinds of people use drugs, people with good intentions, people that are super intelligent, people that maybe are a little bit lazy and just want to take the easy road. And we could group me in that category as well. But the point is, I hope that nobody falls into this deep, dark cycle of being completely consumed with meth culture and going from one meth house to another to another because things can get really dark really quickly as you could probably imagine just from these few examples I've talked about today. Um, and my heart goes out to anybody that is struggling with meth addiction because it's by far, for me, was the absolute hardest drug to get off of. But I can talk in another video about like the brain and more like how it works and how the meth did do a lot of damage to my brain, but there's also plenty of things that I've done in my recovery to kind of combat that damage. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And if I can go from shooting up every single day for years on end to getting clean and staying clean over seven years, I do believe if anybody wants to do it, they can do it. It's just getting um, enough, getting enough, um, it's really just getting enough of a fire under your ass to go for it and to start pursuing it because the first year is the absolute hardest and it often gets worse before it gets better. It did for me. So if you're in your first year, keep with it. It's completely worth it. It's going to be the hardest thing you ever do. But then when you get past that, it's going to be the most worthwhile thing you ever do. And that's all I can say about it. So I hope this video reaches somebody and, um, I hope I didn't just make an ass of myself for no reason. <laughs> there we go.